Okay. Um, so, s probably most of you have followed the news quite recently and have seen Mark Zuckerberg being extremely positive about artificial intelligence and machine learning. He said, well, it's going to change our lives forever in the positive way. But on the other hand, you have another titan called Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX and Tesla. He's very negative on the other hand. Like, he said AI and machine learning is a fundamental threat to human civilization, even though he uses it, in, at least in Tesla, quite a lot. Um, but still, he seems to be really scared of this thing. Uh, and he's even so scared that he even founded a non-profit organization. For something like somebody like Elon Musk to start a non-profit organization, it must mean that at least he's really scared of it. So, <laughs> so who's right? Like, who made the right call here? And to dive deeper into that, I'd like to first take you guys through like, what is human intelligence? And how can we compare it to that AI thing? So actually, all of us, we have an algorithm in, your, in our head running in the background. And even my cat has such an algorithm. And those of you who own cats will recognize this quite well. It's like if you buy something for your cat, a toy, for example, my cat will look at it like, and think, hmm, is that for me? And if he sees that it's a toy, he's like, nah, it's not for me. Although I bought it for him, he, he will not use it. But on the other hand, if you have like, fresh laundry and you put it like, on the table by accident, and your cat sees it, he's like, hmm, that's not for me. So he puts himself on top of the laundry and sheds as many hairs as possible. So <laughs> that's the basic cat algorithm. And we also, all of us, we have such algorithms for everyday tasks. And those everyday tasks, we do them completely unconscious, like talking, walking, swimming, driving. All of those things, we barely think about them. But we have learned them at some point. When we were young, those things were really difficult, but now we do them just automatically. So I call this our execution algorithm. Um, it's mainly located in uh, the back of our heads in the small brain, but throughout our entire brain we have parts that do something like that. So what is intelligence then? Well, basically intelligence is how we learn those things. How do we learn these algorithms, these steps? And in our case it's by example and by a learning algorithm. So how does this learning algorithm work that we have? Well, it's very simple. We try some stuff, we make a lot of mistakes. From those mistakes, we learn and we adjust what we want to do, and we just try again. And we keep doing that for quite a while. So let's compare that how we, well, at least how I learned to drive. Uh, if you still need to learn it, maybe don't, because you won't need it in the future. Uh, but anyway, what's important here is how do we see that we are wrong, and how do we adjust ourselves? Um, so to find out how we're wrong, we use some kind of error measure. measure. And as humans, it's usually like a, an example or some feedback. Like if you crashed into a tree, somebody will tell you, maybe next time, don't drive a car into a tree. Maybe do it slightly bit better. Or maybe somebody who te taught you how to drive, he showed you like parking, you can do it like this. You don't need to hit trees, you can just parallel park perfectly without hitting any other car. Um, and after we got this feedback and this error, we will adjust. And how do we do that? Usually, well, we, we try to predict what our actions will do. Like maybe if I turn a slightly bit more, I would miss the tree or something like that. So we just adjust everything in that way. And then you get something like a learning algorithm, which influences our execution algorithms. So we can go even a step further as humans. We can adjust our adjustment algorithm. And that's where part of our real intelligence comes from. It's basically if we see that how we learn something didn't turn out very well, we can change the way we learn something. So for example, if you take an exam, you learned everything by heart, but they ask like uh, open questions and you need to understand stuff, well, you will flunk the exam and next time you might think, maybe I should try and understand what this course is about and I can do this exam. Uh, we might think that we are super genius in this, but we can only adapt ourselves in very limited ways. But we can do it. So, what is this artificial intelligence thing? Well, they also have algorithms. I mean, computer algorithms. As developers, you guys all know what that is. 
So it's a human programming such an execution algorithm and that human can learn and do better next time. Machine learning, it's basically the next step. So you have the same execution algorithm, but it's a learning algorithm that builds that execution algorithm. It's not a human anymore. And it uses the same strategy, just try, make mistakes, adjust and repeat. It's the same process, basically. And all you need to do that is a lot of examples. Like we humans are really good at learning from a few examples, machine learning isn't. So if you want to try something, make sure that you have a lot of examples. And second thing, which is also really important, have a good error measure. If you have that, don't worry, you'll succeed. Uh, so what's AI? Well, it's basically the next step. And it would be that we can adapt that learning algorithm so that the system itself can learn better how to learn. So are we there yet? Is that something that we can do already? Well. Actually, no, but we are quite close, actually. Um, because if you follow research, you will see that some algorithms basically learn how to build algorithms. They are starting to do that. It doesn't work out that well yet, but you still have to do it manually. But those things are coming. Those things are coming for us, and they will enable us to build cooler stuff in the future. So will that also mean that Skynet is coming? For those who don't know Skynet, it's the evil neural network from the Terminator movies, where the Terminator and, and that Skynet tries to kill all humans. Well, uh, the question we actually need to ask is, is AI going to take over the world? And what's more important is, why would it do that? Like, what, why, why are people so afraid of this AI? Like, why would an AI do that? So, uh, does it have a will to survive or does it have a will to rule the world? Where would that come from? And actually, if you look at the process that I showed earlier, like if it's somewhere, it's not in the execution algorithm. It's somewhere in that learning algorithm. And that learning algorithm is this simple process. So if it's somewhere, it's not in the adjustment algorithm or the try and repeat, it's in that error measure. Because that's a thing you try to optimize and you try to improve on. So. This error measure, measure, does it mean that it will contain something to kill you? Well, actually, that's very unlikely. Because um, if you manually would program something like that, you know quite well that you're doing something really weird. And maybe some researchers will do it, but most of you, I don't think you will start building a killer robot that will annihilate you and all humans around you. So does this mean that Elon Musk is wrong? Like, why is he so afraid? What's, what's happening there? And in my opinion, he's not wrong. And to explain why that is, I made something up. So you can Google it, you won't find it, but I call it the coffee cup problem. Maybe if I repeat this long enough, it becomes a thing on Google, but not yet. So what's the coffee cup problem? Well, let's say you make an algorithm that can build coffee cups. And you uh, say to the algorithm, do whatever you want, go online, uh, learn how to build coffee cups and become the best coffee cup company in the world. Um, so as an er error measure, basically is be the most profitable coffee cup uh, company. It's all you ask it and that's all it will do. So the algorithm will basically build coffee cups as cheaply as possible and it will try to be as profitable as possible. So let's say we make such a thing, we jump on one of Elon Musk's rocket, we go to Mars, we stay there for 15 years, enjoy ourselves, and we come back to Earth after those 15 years. What do you think that we will encounter on our planet if you have such a super intelligent machine learning algorithm running for 15 years? What we will see is coffee cups everywhere. What, well, what it turns out is humans are basically organic matter, and it seems that like maybe organic matter is like a cheap resource to build really cheap coffee cups. So no need for humans. And to solve the profitability, it probably went online, started playing the stock market and made sure that it seemed on paper really profitable. But so there is no evil intent in this algorithm. It just did what we asked it to. So we humans, we have these moral compasses basically genetically encoded into our brains. Uh, and a lot of people, 
won't do something like that just because, I mean, it's morally not right. But these algorithms don't have those moral compasses. So that's where the risk lies in uh, something like AI. So you might think, well, we'll be able to stop that, right? Like just electricity, we just unplug it and everything's done and we don't have to bother about it anymore. Well, there's bad news again. And the reason why is basically singularity. If you haven't heard what, about singularity, it's basically you, the point in time that you reach when AI becomes smarter than us. Um, you might wonder when will this happen? And this will be futurism, of course. I mean, sorry, Sebastian. Um, <laughs> this part of the talk will be quite futuristic. But anyway, um, just look at what computer power and AI intelligence is doing over time. And for computing power, we have a very simple law that's still valid today, and that's Moore's law. So we double the amount of processors on a chip every two years. Um, so you can put that in a graph, and you can compare that with how humans uh, yeah, compute. Uh, and basically, if you look here on this axis, so you see that we are 2017, and for about $1,000, you can buy a computer that has the same processing power, can do the same amount of computations as an insect brain. You can buy it today. Like in a couple of years, you will buy a thousand dollar computer that can do the same amount of computations as a mouse brain. In about 2030, we'll probably reach the point that a thousand dollar computer can do as many computations as one human brain. And the scariest thing, actually, is in 2050, for $1,000, you buy all the human brains on the planet. So does this mean that those computers are smart? Well, of course not. I mean, our computers are still way stupider than insects, even though they have the same computing power for at least $1,000. But um, at least the computing power is there. So if the machine learning and AI evolves, well, at some point, we will reach somewhere that uh, something can become more intelligent. The only thing we have to do is improve on the machine learning and the AI. Uh, and another thing what makes it even more scarier is our perception of intelligence. Because we think that we are that much more intelligent than ants, birds and chimps, but uh, we are actually not that much more intelligent. And the difference between us and the dumbest people that you know, or even Einstein and the dumbest people that we know, we think it's huge. But in reality, the difference is a lot simpler. Like ants and birds, they are completely different. Birds are much more complex than, than an ant, and chimps are a lot more complex than a bird. So it means that at one point where we reach the intelligence of a, of a chimp, at that point, we need to run away or do something really crazy because it won't take long before we reach human intelligence. And if we reach the intelligence of the dumbest people that we know, it won't maybe take a matter of minutes or hours or days before we reach Einstein level. And what you get at that point is probably artificial super intelligence. And what that means is basically at some point you will reach the level of the machine learning engineer or the AI engineer. And at that point, if you build AI that can build AI, well, we're lost. Basically, at that point, the system can build itself and improve upon itself. And that will skyrocket. It will go so fast that no human can follow that. Um, and why is that? Well, AI doesn't rest. It doesn't need some quiet time. It doesn't need to relax. And at that point, we will have reached singularity. It also means that in one hour time, we will need maybe two, three hours to understand what's going on. So after the first day, we need a week to understand what the algorithm did. After the second day, we will need a month. After the third day, the smartest human will need a year to understand what that thing did in three days. And after, let's say, the end of the week, it will take probably a lifetime to understand what that thing did. Because it will go 
forward so much faster than we do because we don't evolve like genetic algorithms are extremely slow so if you think of using them don't they're extremely slow there are other techniques that are much faster um, so when will we reach this singularity well let's be a futurist and stick a date to that if you ask me it's 2060 so it's 10 years after that that you can buy thousand dollar computer that has all human brain capacity so it will take a lot of computing power but I think it will be around 2060. Some people say 2040, some people say 2080, but most researchers in the domain agree that it's before the end of this century. So it's still very futuristic, it's still far away, but anyway, if you step into this, into this domain, keep it in the back of your heads, and within this and 20 years, or 40 years at least, know what you're doing. So what's, what will the, the impact be on society? And let's step back a bit from, from this futuristic thing and just look forward like what's happening now or what's going to happen really soon. Um, and to understand what's happening now, we have to go back into the past. So if we ha we've had already three industrial revolutions. The first one gave us steam machines and production facilities. The second one gave us petrochemical industry, cars and all that stuff. Uh, plastic stockings, really nice. Um, and also, now we're at the third revolution, which is almost to an end, and that's a dif digital revolution. It's the point in time that, gi that gave us the computer, the internet, our smartphones, and all that. So, what happened in those revolutions? Each one of them gave us prosperity and made sure that we progressed, we live longer, we have better lives, so it brought us a lot of good stuff, but not without unemployment. So if you look back in time, a lot of people lost their jobs. It started early on um, when farmers in the 16th century, they were still making clothes in winter because they had nothing else to do, uh, and they would sell those clothes to survive. But then those, the steam engines came and it became really easy to make clothes. So all of those people lost their jobs, and it was really hard for them in the beginning. But if you look at the end, we became so much richer, so much healthier, and we can buy so much more stuff than we did back then. Uh, so what's coming is now is that AI revolution. And many tasks that, uh, that we know now can be automated. Uh, and basically, all repetitive jobs that you know will allow you to gather enough examples, and with those examples, you can train machine learning algorithms that can replace those jobs. So it's good that you guys are here, because maybe your old job might have been replaced by AI, but now you're thinking forward, and you'll be safe for a while. Maybe not for long, because if a lot of people do this job, maybe we can gather some data and automate our jobs as well, so be prepared. Anyway, the first things I think that will be replaced are <coughs> driving, and you all have heard about self-driving cars, accounting, banking, packaging, garbage collection, and line work. And you will see a lot of startups in this domain, and it's a very smart move, because in that domain, uh, there is a lot of things to do. Um, so if you're looking to do something, find something that isn't automated yet, and try to automate it. So it also means that a lot of companies will disappear. Um, if, and uh, one good example, in my opinion, especially here in Germany, is self-driving cars. So now you, at least I own a car, and it sits still in the parking lot five, uh, well, 90, 90 to 95% of the time. It also means that if it wouldn't sit still, it could drive around a lot more. So that car that cost me some money could drive 10 times more than it does today. And uh, actually, I read in the paper yesterday that people in Holland, uh, they spend around 650 euros per year, uh, per month, sorry, per month, on transportation with their car, which means buying the car, insuring the car, fueling the car, and maintaining the car. So imagine if that car could drive 10 times as much or even more. Well, then transportation would probably cost one-tenth of what it would cost now. So those people, instead of spending 650 euros, might spend 100 or 150 euros. It means that they have 500 more euros available. But it also means that if they rent transportation and 10 times less cars are bought, 
It also means that 10 times less cars are built. So here in Germany, it might probably mean that a lot of people will lose their jobs who are working in car factories. And maybe a lot of car brands will just go bankrupt because they're way too slow in this evolution. So prepare yourselves and think about which, which company you work for. <laughs> or at least, well, or at least try to steer the company in a good direction. Anyway, uh, you'll even see this in healthcare, and I always find it kind of funny <coughs> to wonder, like, what do you think? Like, who's going to be replaced, a nurse or a doctor? And I know if I ask it like that, everybody thinks a doctor, but why is that? And the question is, who has the most repetitive job? And it is doctors, and the reason why is basically nurses, they interact with humans, and humans are complicated. So, because humans are complicated, they change all the time, and it's not easy. Well, we all know in our social relationships that computers are much more easy than humans, so it's, well, it's a job that's more likely to stay, and doctors, they interact much less with humans. Um, what they basically do, and they will hate me for it, explaining it this simple, but they look at you, they ask you some basic questions, they feel here and there, they do some experiments, uh, maybe a CT scan or something, and based on that information, which is just data, they give you a diagnosis. Based on that diagnosis, they look at the best treatment they know, and they propose that treatment. And then they look at the outcome. Did the treatment work or not? If it worked, fine, you'll never see the doctor again. If it didn't work, well, they will try again. And they propose a different treatment. And they try maybe a couple of treatments if those don't work. And if that doesn't, didn't turn out very well, they will change their diagnosis and do other tests or send you to another doctor. Or you just, by yourself, go to another doctor. So you recognize here this try, make errors, adjust, repeat algorithm that I showed earlier, which means that this process that doctors do can be completely automated. And what's more interesting here is that if we combine all the data in the world and we look at all the possible treatments that you can do, that you can do the same thing for transportation as you can, oh well, you can do the same thing for healthcare as you can do for transportation you can reduce this cost a lot because you can automate everything and the end result, the treatment that such an algorithm will propose will give you much higher guarantee of a successful outcome than doctors can do today because their knowledge is just limited to the amount of patients that they can see and the amount of papers that they can read in their lifetime. So, of course, you will wonder like which jobs will remain. For now, your jobs are safe, so don't worry. The only thing you need to take care is about is that you work and live in a changing environment because that's really difficult for machine learning. And you also need to combine multiple sources. Machine learning is good at reproducing stuff it has already seen, but it's really bad at learning from new stuff. So keep doing that and you'll be fine. And any job that is like that will be fine. Um, and will there be new jobs? Well, if you look at the past uh, revolutions, it's been, every time it's been really difficult to predict. But there is no reason to worry, because every previous revolution has resulted in many new jobs. Most interesting thing is hairdressers. Like in medieval e ages, there were some hairdressers, but only very few rich people went to a hairdresser. But now, I think most of us go to a hairdresser and get their hair done. So it's a job that didn't exist before and exists now. It's also a job that's not easy, easy to automate because robotics is still lagging behind on machine learning. Just so you know, so you can still become a hairdresser if you want. Um, so AI will reduce the cost of everything, like healthcare, transportation, and all that, and people will buy other stuff because they have money available. But of course, you have to ask yourself, what will they buy? And in my opinion, and what, what you see throughout history is that People, once they have more luxury, they try to buy things that they value more. So in the beginning, you just buy food or healthcare or basic stuff. Once that becomes a commodity and that becomes really cheap, you can buy things that you value. 
And what are those things? Well, the first thing that you can come up with is probably the environment, maybe some animal rights or human, humanitarian things. But there's a lot more than that. Um, you can buy delight, something that surprises you, something that predicts what you need instead of, uh, like, like what fa what's Facebook <coughs> doing right now? So you can Google for an article and hope to find something, but what Facebook tries to do is use, they track you every possible way, and they try to present you with an article that you want to read. Um, and the same thing can happen for health, and the same thing can happen for every chore that you don't like to do, like those vacuum cleaner robots. Probably there will be other stuff that we can automate that we don't like to do. So what will happen after the singularity? Well, I don't know. It's up to us, it's too far away, it's too futuristic, so let's not bother about that. So how do we prepare ourselves? Well, most important thing is to know what you're doing, to take these things into account that I've mentioned to you, just know that you ha need to combine multiple sources. Try to be multidisciplinary, because that's the thing machine learning and AI is really bad in. Uh, maybe we look at organizations like OpenAI, what they are doing, because um, they are working on that stuff and so that we don't have to look at it. And I think they're, they're really doing interesting stuff. They're already also playing games, but still they're also doing interesting stuff. Um, and the most important thing, in my opinion, is change the education. So tell about people what I told you here, but also change how our education system works. Um, so imagine the best possible teacher that you can imagine. And he or she stands, probably she, because women are really good teachers, she stands in front of the, a blackboard and explains you some stuff. Well, like I'm explaining stuff here. And what you usually see in the back of the classroom, even if it's like a wonderful teacher, students are falling asleep and they're not interested. So we humans are really bad at reproducing the content that is given to us. Uh, machine learning, on the other hand, give it some examples and it will do perfectly. So what I think that we should do in our education system is approach is completely different. Kids are, in essence, really creative. They build stuff, they give them a piece of paper and they build crazy airplanes or whatever. They can do stuff that we long, have long forgotten to do. If we can keep that creativity and we embed it in our education system, those kids who finish high school or even university with that knowledge, they will be safe for automation. Uh, so I think we should invest in that kind of education. And also, if you're working in a startup or even within an existing company, look at new business models. And in my opinion, look at business models focused on value, because those are the things that will grow in the future. And I can go over the same list, but what we do ourselves, well, I work for CoScale, and it's very basic, but it's a monitoring company. We monitor microservices, we, our customers get dashboards, but that's not what you want. People don't want to stare at dashboards. People want to know when there's something wrong with their infrastructure. So what we build is an anomaly detection system that will alert them when there's something wrong. And only at that point they need to look at the dashboard and investigate what's wrong. And we try to go even further and predict what's going wrong on their system. So uh, what will go wrong on their system in the near future, so that they can invest in maybe new hardware or optimize their software so that nothing will happen. On the other hand, I also do some health projects where I try to look at what, how can we predict if somebody's becoming ill. And if you know if somebody's becoming ill, what can you <coughs> advise him or her to do to become less ill or to not become ill at all? But I think these are just two silly examples, and probably you guys come up with more interesting stuff than I do. And I think throughout the conference you will find some interesting business models here that people propose, and if they don't, you can ask for it, because usually they have some interesting ideas about that. So I hope I answered this question and that you basically understand that there are risks, but uh, there is also a lot of promise in this technique. And in my opinion, both uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk are right. Thank you.